you're here today, why don't you stand and let's worship together. Come on, put your hands together like this.
that's our heart today, God. We are here for you, Jesus. We're here with our arms and our hearts and our spirits and our souls open to you, Jesus. Father, let this be a place where we encounter you deeply, where we don't just come and sing songs, that we come and we encounter you, that we, we come and we let these truths that we're singing sink deep down inside of us and change us forever. today that would say that today and some of us might say man 2017 I'm glad it's over can I tell you the best is yet to come can I tell you that we serve a faithful God and you haven't seen anything yet but you have to be ready church you got to be willing to step into it you got to be willing to grab a hold of that truth with both hands like it's yours and not let go it's real hard to do, but the payout is amazing. Are you with me? Yes. Just right where you are. If you just want to hold your hands out, close your eyes. And in your hands right there, I want you to place, I want you to place those things that you would say, I feel weak in this area. This area this seems dead. This seems without. It's lacking joy, hope. And as one body, one room, one church, one voice as we all together right now we lift our hands up and we give them to you Father we know you're a resurrecting God you bring dead things to life you're faithful you're glorious you're loving your hope your peace your joy your new beginnings and I pray in 2018 that you would open wide your blessings. Open wide your provision. Open wide your faithfulness. Open wide your hope, your joy, your love, your mercy. Your life. We believe right now that 2018 will be a year of success, a year of joy, a year of newness, of freshness. We speak that over everybody in this room, everybody online watching. We love you, God. Right now, we want to invite our prayer team to either side of the stage. If you have any sort of need, we want you to know that we absolutely believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the strength of speaking hope and life into whatever situation you have. And if you have anything that you need prayer over today, we want to invite you to come now.
you showed up today. We are so glad that you're here. Turn around to somebody, give them a big hug and welcome them. New Year's Eve party! Snacks! Fun! Party! Games! Hello church family. Pastor Red Dog here, also known as Pastor Michael. I'm the Moyo Youth Pastor. I want to let you know about an amazing event we have tonight, 9 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. We're going to have our Moyo New Year's Eve party. That's right. Movies, snacks, games, prizes, and lots of fun. You don't want to miss out. Ages 5th grade through 12th grade. 
And parents, if you want to hang with us, you're welcome to come too. Hope to see you there. Come hang out with Moyo. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Ryan and I wanted to let you know about some exciting things happening in our church. The end of the year is fast approaching, which means we are in the process of preparing your giving statements. If you've had a change of address this year, please fill out an information card in your seat back with your correct information. You can drop it in the bucket later or at the kiosk in the lobby. We have a comedy night January 14th at 6 o'clock with a hilarious comedian named Michael Rowan. Make plans to come to this super fun, family-friendly night and make sure to bring your friends. If you're new to the church, you may have noticed these people all over wearing blue mosaic t-shirts. They're part of our amazing servant leader team. We would love to add you to that team. If you have any interest in becoming a servant leader, fill out the card in your seat back and we'll make sure that you're plugged in. Make sure you stay connected with us during the week. You can do that on Facebook or Instagram. You can stay up to date on Pastor Mark's messages with the podcast. You can even watch past services on Facebook or live stream. We are so grateful to have you as a part of our family here at Mosaic Church. If you're new today, we want to say welcome. We've been praying for you and we are so honored that you've decided to spend your Sunday with us. That's what's happening in our church so far, but if you've missed something, you can visit mosaicokc.church for more information. Thanks for watching and get ready for a life-changing message. Whoa, there you are. Good morning. How are we doing today? Are you loving God? He is an amazing God still, amen? In spite of everything else that's going on in the world, He is still on the throne. I believe that with all my heart. We want to welcome those of you that are watching via your bedroom and your pajamas or whatever you're doing. We want to thank for tuning in to Mosaic Church today. This is Pastor Jesse Bufford standing in for Pastor Mark Crow, who is with his family today and some, we need to, I mean, there's no preachers need family time to, amen. And so uh, I, I can't believe, yeah, let's give God some praise right there. Preachers need some family time as well. I can't believe all these years later that God had called me out of the hot cotton fields of Texas to the pulpits of Oklahoma. Uh, anybody pick cotton before? Anybody? Uh, yeah, only two of you, huh? Uh, <laughs> I remember telling my mom if I ever got out from under her, under her tutelage, I would never eat beans again, and I would never wear anything with cotton, have anything to do with cotton, amen? Uh, I picked so much cotton, it was ridiculous. I was, I'm hoping mama has repented for that. But uh, I, I remember they used to have these machines, they were called cotton pickers. And my mom, uh, one day the cotton pickers came in, and she saw them in this other field, and they were just swooping through there and picking, just swooping this cotton up. And my mother takes her bonnet off of her head in that hot field, and she goes, those machines are going to take our jobs. I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> you can have my job. Amen. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, Pastor Mark has asked me to come and to close out 2017. And I pray to God that you are making plans for 2018, that you are not interested in going into 2018 with a 2017 anointing. I'll say it again, don't, don't try and go into 2018 with a 2017 anointing, amen? How many of us know we've had enough of 2017? And one year time, uh, life can beat you down. If it wasn't for the goodness of God, I don't know where I would be. Because God kept me through a whole year, amen? And we're still standing strong and loving God. And we finished up our, our, our season in the prison on last Thursday. I, I wasn't going to go back. Uh, until the new year, but the girls called from the, the chaplain's office and they said, Pastor Jesse, we, we need a word. Our souls are uh, kind of tormented and, and we just need some word up in this prison. Can you come? And so I called a couple of my team members and I said, do you guys want to roll up to Muskogee, Oklahoma, to that prison up there? And they said, well, we'll go. And so when we got there, the place was packed out to capacity. And there were a bunch of women in there who, who were hungry for God. They were like little baby birds that were waiting for the mom to drop a worm. Come on, somebody. 
And so we had an incredible time. There were well over 200 women in that auditorium. And at the end of the service, they, they all just was, was touched by the word of God. And as far as the eye could see, they were laying out on the floor and up on the pulpit and everywhere. We went past capacity. And that's, that's against the law. Don't tell anybody. Amen. We had way too many women in there, but they were hungry for God in there, and their souls were touched. And so what I want us to do today is I believe God has a word for you today as we go to Mark chapter 8 and 36. And quickly stand up one more time and hold your Bibles up, and I'll get going because I've got a lot I want to share with you today. This is something that we've been doing again as, as you repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what my Bible says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. And I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, somebody say, woo! Amen. Thank God for a lively church. Amen. I was in a church one time. It was so dead, I backed out and called Unsolved Mysteries. Look no further. I found them all. Amen. Well, listen, we know that ever since man was kicked out of the garden, there has been a longing to go back to the garden. When you say my back hurt, you just want to go back to the garden. When you say I have no peace, Pastor Mark has been talking to us about peace and joy and goodwill to man. And today I want to talk to you about something that if it is out of order with God, you will never have peace with God. Your household will not be right. Your life will not be right. You will not be all that God has called you to be if your soul is out of order with God. I believe if you show me a man whose soul is out of order with God, I'll show you a man who is tormented and he, and he does not have direction that he needs in his life. And so ever since man been kicked out of the garden, there's been a longing to go back to the garden. And just because you have a Bible and just because you have a, come to church and you do all the things and you know how to do church stuff and you know how to do church service and we know how to do all of that. But I'm reminded today of a man by the name of King David who had stole a man's wife and committed ad adultery and had a man murdered and he ran back to his throne. And the Bible says that he sit there on the throne. He looked like a king. He sounded like a king and he gave orders like a king. But the Bible said that his soul was tormented and on the inside he cried day and night. He cried day and night. Why did he cry day and night? Because his soul was out of order with God. And so you can come to church and your soul still be out of order with God. And so I'm reminded of 33 years ago, a, a, a two and a half year old kid walked into my garage and, and she said to me, pulled on my coat, it was winter time and I was minding my own business trying to stay away from the Christians. And this little two and a half year old kid came out into the garage and tugged on my coat and she asked me a question. She said, Daddy, are you going to heaven or to the hot place? And that was a question that really needed an answer, church. In other words, she was saying to me, where's your soul going to rest? And so I knew about heaven and I knew about hell. I had heard about both of these places as a little boy. And if I had my rathers, I'd rather go to heaven than I would go to a place called hell. This is a place that we don't talk about much in our pulpits today for whatever reason. And we've come to a place where, where you almost got to be politically correct to speak the word of God anymore. Thank you for that one amen. But things have changed, and we're going to talk about that a little later on. But she was asking me, where is your soul? And at that moment, I was living the American dream. I had money in my pocket. I had money in the bank. I had money in the Teamsters Credit Union. I had two Cadillacs. I had a house, even had a dog in the backyard. <laughs> I had everything that a man could want. I was a fairly good basketball player, and I was gaining popularity with the men that played basketball at the University of New Mexico, the Lobos. I hung out with them, and I could walk into a, a gymnasium and literally change the atmosphere, or walk into a room and change the atmosphere with humor. In other words, I thought I had it going on, 
But this two-year-old daughter was really saying to her daddy in Mark 8 and 36, For what shall it profit you, daddy, if you shall gain the world and lose your soul? In essence, that's what she was saying to me. Daddy, what, what, what are you doing? What are you going to do with your soul? Is your soul not something that matters to you? What do you treasure the most is my assignment this morning. What do you treasure the most? What's the most important thing to you? And Pastor Mark has been talking about trying to bring peace to us and joy to us. But if your soul is out of order with God, you can forget about peace and joy. Just ask the man who was caught up in the Gadarean tombs. He was there cutting himself day and night. The world had beat him down and he was in the tombs of the Gadarean tombs and he would cut himself day and night. His soul was out of order. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, let's go to the other side. Sometimes you got to go to the other side to help a soul out. If you have not won one soul in the year 2017, shame on you. I know it will get quiet right there. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you have not led at least one person to Christ in 2017, but I will ask you this next year. <laughs> Amen? Amen? A soul starting with yours is the most important thing there is on planet Earth. There's nothing more important than a soul. What do you treasure the most? The Bible says in Matthew 6 and 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And most people uh, quote it this way, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. No, 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 don't get it twisted. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? I've heard it often said, if you show me a, a man or a woman's checkbook, I'll show you where her treasure is and where her thoughts are and what she, what she does the most. I'm not going to ask for your checkbook, so don't, you don't have to. I'm not going to show him my girl. I was shopping like crazy. <laughs> so the human composition and the very fabric and the, and the very anatomy of a man is made up of spirit, soul, and body. And the most important of these is, somebody say, the soul. The reason being, it is the eternal part of the human being, and absolutely nothing on, worth it, on this earth is worth comparing your soul to. Nothing on planet earth, so we must be careful not to tap out to the things of the world. Your soul is the most valuable thing there is. Nothing should change the course of you attending your soul. Some of you have some things that are valuable. We're going to talk about things and stuff today. I believe things and stuff is important, but I believe that your soul is more important than that. I believe that mothers are going to have to take a time out from the children. I believe that fathers are going to have to step in in that department so a wife can, can get her soul back right with God, so a wife can have time with God. Help me, ladies, up in this house. I'm trying to throw you a bone. You ain't saying nothing. Amen. Because sometimes the, the mother got to walk away from all this chaos. And there are some of us that are grandparents that are, that are helping our children stay down in the saddle and helping with the grandkids. Can I get one amen right there? And so you're trying to help your daughter so, so that she can have that peace. And I'm praying for my children. I, 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 I tell the devil he's crazy as all get out if he think I can go to a place called prison and win thousands of souls for Christ and let my own house fall through the loops. That makes no sense. Can I get an amen? amen? And so what I want you to know today, if you have you tapped out to the world and your answer to this question may very well determine the destination of your soul. The world has a lot to offer. The world as it once was is no more. Things like it used to be is no more. It is harder now to win a soul than it ever was in, the, in my life anyway. It's hard to win a soul now. Why? Because we all got our own philosophy. We got our own little feelings, and preacher, you need to get with it. This is a, this is a new millennium. You need to get with it, brother. <laughs> no, the gospel changes not. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never fail. And so we continue to speak the word to those that say, brother, that's an old fogey, and your, your word is a hate message. That's how people look at the Bible today as if, as if it's a hate message. No, you're changed. I'm not changing. Yeah, I said it. I'm not changing. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my, I keep preaching. Let me just go this way. 
John 10 and 10 says this. All of us know what it says. That the enemy comes to do what? Kill, steal, and do what? And I'm telling you right now, the devil does not want your stuff. He wants your soul. The devil don't want your car. He can't even drive. <laughs> he doesn't want your stuff, lady and mister. He does not want your, your John Deere tractor. He does not want your big John Deere. He wants your soul. So what's the most important thing to you today? Is it your car? Is it your clothes? Is it your shopping sprees? Is it, it, what are you doing? What, what, what is most important to you today? Your soul, amen? And so as we go to Job chapter 1, most of us know this story. The devil is roaming through and forth and goes into heaven. And I don't know how he ended up in heaven, but he got there. And the Lord said to him, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God, shuns evil. And the devil says to God, you have put a hedge around his whole household and everything that he has is blessed from the ground up. Come on, somebody. He is blessed beyond measure, and I cannot get to him. But he said to God, I'll tell you what you do. If you take your hand off of him, he will curse you to your face, and he will, he will change his attitude. And God says to the devil, go ahead and get after it. But I'm telling you right now, Mr. Devil, I'm in charge. You can touch his camels, you can touch his donkeys, you can touch his house, you can touch his land, you can touch his field, you can touch his stuff, but don't touch his soul. You see, the soul was important to God then, and it's still important to God right now. And so he's telling him, go ahead and get after it. But the Lord said to him very well in verse 12, everything that he has, you have power over it. But on the man himself, do not lay one finger. Do not destroy the soul of this man. I'm telling you right now, this is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, that you and I, uh, our souls would be saved. What does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have what kind of life? And the everlasting is that part of the soul. That's the soul that's going to be lasting. When a heart stops pumping, the, the heart stops pumping, the, the body dies and the mind goes. I believe the mind stays there somewhere. But there's something about the soul that still remains. And the question today is, where will your soul end up? Can somebody say, I hear you, preacher? Where were your soul? I'm talking about our souls today and the soul of your, of your neighbor. And remember Coach Velvano, Jimmy V, when he was giving his last speech, he said, cancer can, can, can take away my physical being, but it cannot touch my mind, and it cannot touch my heart, and it cannot touch my soul. And so it sounds like Jimmy V had it together. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And so I want you to know today that things have changed in America. It seems that it is getting harder and harder and harder to speak truth to this generation. And so I want you to go over to Acts chapter 24, and I'm going to show you something in 24, starting in verse 22. That it is getting harder and harder and harder to win a soul for Christ, because everyone thinks they know everything. In Acts chapter 24 and 22, talking about Felix, he was a man who knew about God, and he was putting Paul on trial because Paul was talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in uh, Acts 24 and 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, he adjourned the proceedings. And when I see as the commander come, he said, I will decide your case. Paul is on trial. And he ordered the centurion, he said, keep Paul under guard to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Now, here's why I want y'all to mark in your Bible and to roll along with me. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was the Jewish and he sent for the preacher. Somebody say he sent for the preacher. He sent for Paul and he listened to him as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ. Now watch the reaction of the man who sent for the preacher. Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. We can stop right there and have revival in America. That's a prison. That's a prison verse right there. He said he talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. And Felix said, uh, hold up now. Wait. Hold up. That's enough for now. You can leave. When I find it more convenient, I'll send for you. You see, we want to hear what we want to hear. I'm talking to more than two of you right there. 
You say, preacher, if you preach on prosperity every Sunday, I'll come and I'll listen and I might give, but don't tell me about my sin. Oh, y'all ain't going to help a brother. <laughs> don't tell me about my sins and don't tell me about what I'm doing wrong. And don't tell me about my cheating and don't tell me about my lying and don't tell me about this, that, and the other. Don't tell me about that and I'll listen to you. Other than that, I'll send for you when I need you. Remember years ago, here a while back, my mom called me and she said, son, uh, uh, these children down here, your sisters and your brothers and, and your nieces and nephews, she says, their souls are out of order and they're dying and literally I believe they're headed to a devil's hell. She said, can you come and do a revival here in this house? And I said, well, mom, I, I, I'm really busy. She said, boy, do you know who just asked you that? <laughs> I said, okay, mama, I'll come to Texas and we'll have revival. And so my mom opened up her house that day. And I said, Mom, how are we going to get all these people over here? I have ten sisters and four brothers. And then all them people got babies. Come on, somebody. And Mama says, I tell you what, I'm going to go in the backyard and fire up the barbecue pit. And she fired up that smoker, and they thought they were coming for only for physical food. But when they got there, Mama said, get them now, son. Get them. They're here. Get them. Get them. There, there they are right there. Get them. And so that day, as I, as I went on that mission that my mother, get, my mother gave me this assignment, and 19 of my family members came to Christ that day. Amen. 19 souls were revived that day. And so I, I remember this clearly as I was, after this revival, I was pretty tired, and one of my sisters called me in, on the phone, and she says, what gives you the right to come down here getting everybody saved? And I thought, well, that's interesting. Your bozo husband was one of them. He got saved. You ought to be thanking me and giving me an offering. I didn't say that, but I'm saying it now. And I hope she's looking. I really do. And I said to God, what's really going on here? Why am I challenged in this manner? Why was she not happy about this? Why is she not happy that these souls came to Christ? And I'd never seen this verse before. It is in Mark chapter 6, 3 through 5, where Jesus simply said that a prophet is without honor in his own home. A prophet is without honor in his own home. It is harder for a prophet to win anybody else in his home than anything else in the world. It's hard for, for a father to win his children over. How is it that you can go into a place called prison and, and well over 100 women come to the altar crying with tears streaming out of their face and wanting to change because they honored the prophet that came to them? But a prophet is without honor in his own home. I don't go anywhere else preaching any different gospel. How is it that they change? But in your home, you have a harder time. I'll leave that alone. But a prophet really is without honor in his own home. Let's go over and look at something else and, and what keeps us away from God. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, as Jesus was leaving, is setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him. I don't even know if you run into somebody, you're excited. He ran up to him and knelt before him, and he asked Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, it was a soul check. He did everything right. He ran to the master, and he was a soul check. He said, Father, what must I do to inherit this eternal life? He's checking his soul just like my little daughter checked my soul. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God, except God alone. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud or honor and honor your father and your mother. And there's a place where we can all stop and have revival. Honor your mother and your father. But I'm saying today to the mothers and the fathers, there's a verse for you too. As well, the Bible says, do not provoke your children to anger. Oh, I got quiet right there. Okay. And here's what I would have added if I was Jesus. Oh, by the way, these things I've just spoken to you will be removed from your public schools. Amen. I would have added that. My emphasis added right there. I believe that's where all of our stuff started. I believe that's where it's all started right there. 
taking the prayer and taking the commandments out. But anyway, this young man says, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. He thought he was all that in a bag of chips and looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. And he said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he said, and then come follow me. I ask you today, what is it that's keeping you from coming all the way with Jesus? What is it? What are you holding on to? What is your most prized possession? And then, but in verse 22, but at these words, he was saddened and he sent, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. You see, he acted like he wanted to get his life together. He did everything right. He came to church right. He asked, he asked the teacher, what should I do? The teacher told him what he could do. But he didn't do it. He chose to hang on to his goods. And Jesus uh, gave a resounding statement. Simply put, it was loud and clear. He said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Y'all looking at me, well, he don't like stuff. Yes, I do. I love stuff. In fact, high on my bucket list to get is two things. Two cars. One is a 1936 Cadillac Fleetwood, $59,900. The other one is a 2018 Toyota Land Cruiser starting at $83,665. Put those two together, that's $143,565. But I guess what, church? They better start chasing me because I ain't chasing them and lose my soul. I ain't chasing after nothing and lose my soul. It ain't going to happen. If somebody wants to bring those to my house, I'll take them. (laughs) Don't get it twisted. I like stuff. But stuff is not going to keep me from church. Stuff ain't going to keep me from giving tithes and offerings. I need more than one amen right there. Amen? Amen. Stuff ain't going to keep me from doing that. See, God, a lot of people say, "Woo!" and I win $354 million. I'm going to give some to Jesus. <laughs> you wouldn't even give him 10 of the 100 he gave you. You wouldn't even give 10 of the 100 that he gave you, and we'll give 100 of the 1,000 that he gave you. So stop lying to Jesus, thinking that he's going to go, you know what? I'm going to bless her today with this ticket. Got quiet. Some of y'all was like, man, there goes my ticket. (laughs) Are y'all still here? So he's saying, what is the most valuable thing to you? And, 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 And I want things to chase me. I like things. God puts me around people that have that have things and they share things with me. Since I've been here in Oklahoma, when God called me out of New Mexico, he knew that I would need help. And he has put me around five or six people that has stuff. And they just give it to me. I don't go chasing after it. I just can't do it. I, I'm too busy for the kingdom of God. I don't have time to go restore no 50, no 36 Cadillac. That take too much time. Don't bring me no piece of junk to my house. Restore it. <laughs> if I got to restore it, I got to waste up too much time. Running, getting nuts and bolts and carburetors and tires. No. You keep that one, bring the other one. (laughs) Are y'all still here? I'm trying to help somebody. Amen. And what I want you to know is that not very many people arrive at a funeral in their favorite car. And so the disciples, they were astonished when Jesus said this. And they said, "Well, well, who in the world can be saved then? And Jesus said to them, with man, it is impossible with God, all things are possible. The disciples were freaking out. They was like, well, well, who can be saved? He said, Lord, we've given up everything as it is to come follow you. And then now you're telling us that what, what do we have to do? What can we do? God doesn't want your stuff. You know, God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have stuff. He wants Mosaic Church to have every single speaker guitar player every single talent he wants us to have it all in fact i believe god is preparing a great big old building somewhere for mosaic church right now bigger than this i just don't think this one's going to be able to hold enough people thank god for you three excited people 
The devil, give your neighbor a high five and say, the devil doesn't want your stuff. He he doesn't want your stuff, amen? And and there's a thing called the big five, uh, uh, Africa's most big five sought after trophy animals. They go after the lion for his bones, his teeth, his claws, and it's worth $50,000. They go after the, the elephant for his tusk, and the status of the ele- elephant is, v- is vulnerable. Trophy, twenty five to 60000 They go after the white rhino for, for its, uh, its, its trophy horns, and a trophy uh, white rhino, the, the status is 125000 and up. They go after the leopard for, for its beautiful skin, near threatened. Trophy leopard skins, 15000 to 35000 the Cape Buffalo, they go after it for its horns as a four feet span, and they go after it from $17,000. They go after these things. Where are you going with this, preacher? They're only taking the most valuable part off of these animals. They're devouring them for the most valuable part, and that's what the devil is doing to you. He doesn't want your, your Gucci purse. Come on, somebody. He doesn't want your gators or your eel skins or your Escalade sitting on 22s. He does not want your farm or your, he, do, he wants your soul. So what is the most valuable thing in this, uh, on, on earth to you? It has to be your soul. It's, it should be an easy answer by now. Remember Cecil the lion, they killed, some dentist killed him, $54,000. They're devouring these animals for the most valuable parts they possess. The devil, he loves to come into the church and, and his big five is a pastor. That's one of his big fives. He likes to devour the pastor. He doesn't want the pastor's stuff. He wants his soul. And then he wants to take down the praise team. Isn't our praise team doing an incredible job? You know what he wants to do? The devil wants to come in and, and devour Mark and his, and his praise team. I give, I give him some kudos for where they've come and what they're doing right here. But the enemy wants to start devouring them and taking their talent away from them. And it is not the talent that they want. They want their souls. That's what the enemy wants. He wants to destroy our souls. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, it's simply saying, and he's talking to the Christians. He's saying, be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like or as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's coming to devour you, looking for someone to devour, looking for someone to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Bible tells me that he came as a roaring lion. You know what he reminds me of on a good day? The one in the Wizard of Oz. The Bible says we can put him under our feet. Come on, somebody. Or do what Dorothy did. Just slap him. (laughs) I know you're going on the trip, but I'm in charge. Don't forget it. Amen. Amen. You have control of your life. Let me tell you something. It's all over your Bible that the enemy wants to destroy your soul. When they drugged that woman in who had been caught in the act of adultery, they didn't care about that woman. They came in all religious. Teacher, the law of Moses says we should stone such a woman. What do you say? They wanted Jesus to condemn her soul to hell. That's what they wanted. They didn't care about that woman. They didn't care about her. They wanted to destroy her soul. That's what they wanted to do. Many of you said, man, I wonder what was it, it was like with Samson and Delilah. Then Samson stayed all night with Delilah. Delilah didn't want that man's body. She wanted his soul. She wanted to destroy his soul. That was the one thing that she wanted was his soul. She didn't care about Samson. She simply wanted to destroy the soul. But I've got a key ingredient for you. When you get to that point where you know that the enemy has tried to take you out and your hair begins to grow back and the anointing begins to come back on you and you stand in between them two poles and you say, Father, anoint me one more time. Just do it one more time. The enemy is trying to take your soul. And I'm going to tell you something right now. The other day, a man took me through his, through his barns. 
And in those three or four barns that he had, he had Porsches and Lamborghinis and Mercedes and special Cadillacs and Corvettes. And he had Porsches and he had cars that, that were in the movies that, that movie stars had owned. And he had bought all of these cars. And as far as the eye could see in these barns, he had all this stuff stacked up in that barn. And I'm not, I like stuff. I'm not against stuff. But I pray to God that when you're collecting stuff that your soul is right. I like stuff. I don't have a problem with stuff. You got to make sure that your, your heart is right with God and these things are not pulling you away from God. And he had all these stuff in these barns. And I was reminded of, of, of a man in Luke chapter 12. And he said he told them a parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my, my surplus. In other words, my, my overflow. I, I won't give it away. I won't help anybody. I'll put it in a bigger barn. And, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for your years. And take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him in verse 20, you fool. God called him a fool. And here's what he was saying after he called him a fool. He says, this very night, your life or your soul will be de de demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? He you said, who's going to get it now? You go, you're going to just build a bigger barn and that's, that's what makes you thrive and that's what makes you go is getting more and getting more and getting more and getting more. But at some point in your life, this stuff, would not be enough. And what he was saying to this man tonight, I'm not coming to you and asking you for grain. I'm not going to ask you tonight for corn or wheat. I'm not going to ask you for cotton or peanuts or whatever it is tonight that you have in your barn. There's one thing that I'm at demanding tonight, and that is your soul. Don't get quiet on me when I'm preaching good. This isn't scared straight. <laughs> Y'all love God today? He simply says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. For where your treasure is, church, there your heart will be also. And many people quote this the wrong way. They say, where your heart is, there your treasure. They say, no, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so I want to I want to I want to leave you all with this as we go out of 2017 into 2018. As I get ready to close, I want you to understand that your, your soul is the most important thing to you. In fact, after all, we've gone through Christmas and all of us got presents on Jesus' birthday. All of us got things. But you know what I did this year? I, I made an effort and I said to myself, as Pastor Rick gets to come in a, in, in a moment, I said to myself, I'm not going out of my way. This year, I want my grandchildren to understand the real meaning of the season. This year, I want my children to understand, my grandchildren to understand that they have a soul. And, I, and the Bible said, train them up when they're young and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Train them up when it's young and they won't run off to prison if they'll stay with what you're teaching them. And I, and I looked out in my backyard the other day and uh, before Christmas, and I looked out in by my patio window, and I went, my God, it looks like a John Deere dealership around here. <laughs> they had little gators and tractors and another gator over here and a trailer to hook behind it and all that stuff. I said, I'm not buying all that stuff this year. And we sit them down and read the story about the birth of Jesus because that lesson would be the most valuable However, they, get, they did get a few things. But I want us to understand as we go into 2018 that the most important thing in your life is your soul. And don't go saying that your neighbor's soul is, is oh, I can't win him. He's done. They're, they're toast. <laughs> no, you must continue to try. You must continue. I love my neighbors. One of my neighbors, I've been cutting her yard for 25 years. No pay, none. No, I just love my neighbor. 
And the other day, my grandkids ran across her lawn, just walked across her lawn, and she says, who does that? And I'm like, who cut someone's lawn for 25 years for free? Who does that? <laughs> this is a lady that I'd gone and prayed with in her house and prayed for her kids, and she was irritated. You ain't going to win your neighbors being irritated. Put some stuff aside. Pray for them. Continue to pray. Bow your heads with me. I want to pray with you today. There's a simple message today is what's more important to you today? And so, Father, I come today as their heads are bowed and, and they're checking out their own heart and saying, what have I valued above God? What have I valued above going down to the church and picking up a broom and sweeping the sanctuary? What have I valued more than paying tithes and offerings in, into the kingdom? And we're not begging for money. You're going to find that out in just a moment, that we're not begging. But what is keeping me from going into ministry and doing what God has called me to do? Why have I done everything except the one thing? Why can't you get rid of the one thing and go all the way with God? Don't be like the rich young ruler that, that thought he had it together. And when God gave him an opportunity, he turned and went away because it was that one thing that he had that was keeping him away from, from Jesus and doing what, what, what he wanted him to do. And as Jesus went into Martha and Mary's house, Martha was encumbered around, about, about many things. But he said to her, your sister Mary has chosen the one thing. And that is to sit at my feet and learn and get engulfed with the Spirit of God. And she's learned to do the one thing. And so let's turn loose the many things and embrace the one thing. And so God, right now, under the sound of my voice, there are many of us now, our minds, and Pastor Rick, come on up. Our minds have been, our minds have been touched. Our hearts have been touched. Our minds can't think the same way. You cannot go out of this house thinking the same way. Turn loose that one thing that keeps you away from doing what God has called you to do. Some of you need to get back in ministry. Some of you need to get going again. Some of you need to stand up and let go of that offense and let go of that man and let go of that woman and let go of stuff. Somebody say the one thing. And that one thing is a walk with Jesus Christ. And so I tell you that we go into 2018. Getting prepared to take this region to new levels. And Pastor Mark, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to share as we close 2017 and get our troops ready for 2018. In Jesus' name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Jesse. Love you, brother. <clears throat> Some of y'all know that, but uh, that's one of my best friends on this whole planet. Uh, he stood beside me and been with me, and I've been beside him and been with him for over... 25 years, but at any rate, um, some of y'all know me, some of you don't. I kind of forget that because I'm not here as often as I used to be. I did want to let you know that um, I'm Pastor Rick Ratliff. I am your executive pastor. I know I'm not here all the time. Um, after there was, when there was no Mosaic Church, there was uh, Mark Crow and Rick Ratliff, and we had a dream uh, that God had given us about Mosaic Church. And uh, by executive pastor, really, I, Mark has put me and God has placed me in charge of the finances of Mo Mosaic Church. And I wanted to share with you, basically give you a uh, state of the church address, if you would say, on this last day going out of 2017. And um, I, I, I felt like the best way I could do it was, um, I, I want to tell you a story. So if you'll, if you'll give me four minutes, we'll get on out of here and we'll bring the new year in correct, but I think it's really important that you hear what's been going on here at Mosaic Church. So when we were over at Noah's, you know, we were meeting in a little event center over there, and uh, God's, God told us that it was time to move, and we needed to grow. We couldn't grow there, and we moved, and he gave us this incredible building that we're in now, and that in itself is a miracle. I, can't, I don't have time to tell you everything the way that that went down, but at um, any rate, trust me when I tell you it was a miracle that we could. We moved here, and we took on um, our, our rent went up four times, or maybe even five times when we moved here, but... I just felt like we couldn't do what God was calling us to do if we stayed where we were at, that we had to take a step in faith, and we did, and we, we came here. And um, when we came here, there was nothing left. This place was stripped bare. 
And so how do you know that you, to be able to have church and to reach out and to minister to people, you got to have sound, you got to have lighting, you got to have audio and video. And we reached out to a local company here and we said, hey, you know, we're moving in this new building. Would you price out a, a sound system and a lighting system for us and a, and a video system? And they came back and they gave us a price and I, I think it was somewhere around $200,000 and it was a fair price. I mean, we know what this type of stuff costs. It's not cheap. That's with installation and all the technology and everything. But there was just absolutely no way that we could do $200,000. And so and it was late. It was late in the year. It was, we came in here, if you all remember, any, the ones that were here with us then, on uh, Christmas Eve. We, we moved in. We didn't have any chairs. We didn't have any. We had none of this stuff. So um, I, I reached out to someone I knew that had uh, done some work for me in the past, and I said, hey, uh, Richard, we need uh, sound and audio and video, and what do you think you could do that for? And I said, listen, man, we're on a tight budget. And Richard came back, and I think he gave us a price somewhere in the 80000 range, and, and, you know, which that's a whole lot better than 200000 and, uh, but you know what? I still felt like it just wasn't possible or that we weren't supposed to. Anything is possible. I mean, to be honest with you, I could have wrote the check myself and bought that for us, but I didn't think I was supposed to. And um, so I, I said, hey, can you, can you pare that down to something that we could grow into, that we can build? And he said, yes, I can. And he cut that price almost in half. And he came in, and of course he gave us half of the stuff, too. You know, and I mean, he didn't, so we get half the stuff. And, and there's really no way that we should be able to be having the sound that we have, the video that we have, the audio that we have, the lighting that we have at that price. It just doesn't make sense. It's actually a miracle. It's another miracle from God. And so, you know, and part of it, and I'm going to get to that, part of that is because of the people that God brought to us that have been able to manage this system and tweak this system and work on this system and make it right. I'll introduce one of those people to you here in a minute. But um, about June, and he, and he knew that, you know, we, we would grow this system. You know, uh, matter of fact, I knew we were supposed to have 10 line array speakers right up here. And we were supposed to have 10 more line array speakers over here. In other words, you could be anywhere in this auditorium, and it would sound pristine. It would sound like you're in the Sistine Chapel. It would sound, and, and trust me, I love stuff. And I, and, and I love music and sound probably as much or more than anybody in here. I told in the first service that if you come into my house, you, I can, you, you will hear some sound. I mean, I've got, I've got the sound system that you can't even understand. It's not just in one room. It's in five rooms. And so, um, so I like that stuff. And Richard, he texted me in June, and he said, just let me know when you're ready for truly amazing sound in Mosaic's auditorium. And I started thinking about it. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, man, I was tempted. Because we had waited some time now. We'd started growing, and, you know, we'd had some issues with the sound system. It wasn't, well, it didn't sound that good in areas and spots and when we filled this up. <clears throat> and, and God put it on my heart, and I wrote him back a letter. I'm going to read you that letter because I think that tells you the state of Mosaic Church. And, and, and number one, let me just tell you that you guys are incredible. This family of people... They call themselves members and servant leaders at Mosaic Church, have given uh, beyond what I could have imagined. We've been able to do more than I could think or even imagine. And, I, you know, so I wrote him back, and I said, I, I surely will, Richard. When I'm, we're ready for truly amazing sound, I'll, I'm going to write you back. I said, but we've budgeted no church improvements. And although we would love to have amazing sound, the sound you installed has proven adequate, and we're thankful for that. I said, we felt like God has called us to budget towards missions instead of capital improvements. We're giving over $3,000 a month into an Oklahoma prison ministry. We've been able to give thousands, over $1,000 every month, to an orphanage, a clinic, and school in Haiti. We've been able to give monthly to a young leadership training ministry called Young Life. We have consistently been going into one of the poorest public housing complexes in Oklahoma City and giving food and clothing 
school supplies, haircuts, and just simply loving on the kids and the families. We've been able to sow thousands into other local churches, and that doesn't even make sense. Most churches are not sowing into other local churches, but I felt God said we were supposed to. So we've been able to help them to minister to people and to exhibit how we are all one body of Christ. We've been able to touch hurting people's lives through our benevolence, giving for unexpected funerals, food, housing, and utilities. We were able to give thousands into hurricane relief this year, both in Texas and in Florida. We gave through the Baptist Men's Disaster Relief and the Samaritan's Purse. We have an online ministry that has brought the good news of the love and mercy of Jesus Christ to India, Saudi Arabia, Europe, Central America, and throughout the United States. I said, Richard, I'm truly amazed at what God has allowed us to do in just over a year in ministry. And thank you for the part you have played in helping this incredible ministry called Mosaic Church touch people in Oklahoma City and around the world. And all of this has been accomplished, I didn't tell him this, this is for you, with just five paid staff members. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer staff member just like Kevin and Robin and Anita and, and anyone else here. But you know what? God has trained me over the years, so... Trust me when I tell you this, your, your giving has touched thousands of people around this world this year. We've helped people that desperately needed someone to show them the love of Jesus Christ. So proud of you guys and the ability that you've had to sacrifice and do the right thing and listen to the word of God and then do what he says do. And I told Richard, I said, <laughs> yeah, we'd truly love to have amazing sound, and I believe we will one day soon. But for now, we're satisfied with the sound, and we are dissatisfied with our outreach. We want to reach more, change more, and touch more people in Christ, your brother Rick. So that's kind of the state of our financial situation at Mosaic Church. We, we've done incredible We've done it through your giving. I don't know if I have my phone here with me. Um, I need Luke 648. But, you know, the Bible says that given, it'll be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And, to, and with the measure that you sow will be the measure you'll get back. So it's a simple prophecy. We're going to go ahead and we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings now. So ushers, if you would go ahead and prepare that. And um, as we're receiving that, yeah, you know what? And let's give God the glory. Can we just give him praise for what he's done? I mean, and that is you. That is this body of believers, this body of givers, this body of people. And one of the reasons that our sound system sounds as amazing as it does is that God has brought us people here like Pastor Mark Ryan. I mean, he was a miracle, a blessing from God to come in here and to help us straighten this thing out. And then he brought us a young man named Stuart and his wife, Sarah. And they came in here and they volunteered and they were giving. And Stuart's been working. He says, I'll help you with your sound. And, and you know what he does for a living? He installs church sound systems all across the state of Oklahoma. And so beyond that, I do want to introduce this couple because they will be the sixth staff member. Uh, that we that will start. He's already started, kind of, but he'll he'll start full time here at Mosaic Church as our community group pastor. So if you want to get part of a community group and you want to be around people who love God and have the same kind of interest that you do, stand up, Stuart and Sarah. I want to introduce you to our newest pastors, Stuart and Sarah Jenner. And he is mostly responsible for our. Uh, budget sound system sounding like a million bucks. Uh, are we ready to pass? The, have we done the offer and we got the buckets passed and all that? We already done it? Pass those buckets. And as we pass them, I want to say, hi, Pastor Mark. I'm so glad you're somewhere where it's nice and warm and sunny. And uh, I'm here in uh, Oklahoma where it was minus two this morning. You know, some of you guys know the reason I'm not here all the time is because I operate a couple of businesses in South Florida. And when I walk through the doors this morning, the people who know me well are going, why are you here? Because usually when it's cold, I'm going to be down in South Florida. Uh, but at any rate, 
I was here because Pastor Mark, he knew he was out this week. So thankful he gets to see his grandchildren and his children uh, during this time. And I'm so thankful that we have a, a preacher that can bring it like Pastor Jesse Bufford in Mark's absence. Thank you. So everybody, if we're done taking up the offering, I know y'all have done the best that you can do. Continue in 2018. I believe that we... God's going to do an amazing thing here at Mosaic Church. The people that are supposed to be here are going to come in. We'll have to pull back the curtains for every service. I think we'll be doing three services before 2018 is over. We'll probably have three services on Sunday. And, um, and you know what? And we're going to do more here. And we're going to do more around the world. We'll be able to reach out and touch even more people than we've already been. So look, let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to go out 2017, our last time to meet here, with a big old shout of hallelujah. Do it like you were standing in Times Square and the ball's dropping down and it's striking midnight. How would y'all do it then? One, two, three. Hallelujah. I love you guys, man. I was lost with a broken heart You picked me up, now I'm set apart From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words could say I follow you, Lord, for all my days Fix my eyes, follow in your ways Forever free and unending grace